differentiators was stimulating, certainly from conversations over the tea break. I think it stimulated interest, <coughs> everything you need um, to be able to, um, to, 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 to try that out. In terms of um, our website, there is a, a, a note there that says that if for some reason you have a different version of MATLAB, um, so that the version we've got here is not the appropriate one for you, then um, you can ask and it will make a version of the um, differentiator for your version of MATLAB. So I perhaps should just mention that the website given on the slides or via our research gate page. I don't know whether any of you use research gate, but we have a project on there around this differentiator. Um, uh, you can use either of those channels to easily get a, um, a, uh, a version that will be suitable for your, for your MATLAB implementation. So we're now moving on to consider complex systems. We've seen that the sliding mode techniques are robust and fundamentally it shouldn't make any difference if you're, if you're, um, technique is, is sufficiently robust or not. Um, um, you know, if, if it's sufficiently robust, complexity is, is not a curse. Complexity is, 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 not, is not difficult. But I think we're at a very interesting point in the evolution of the topic of control engineering. So I'm going to start in this presentation looking at systems and control challenges. I'm going to take as my starting point this recent IFAC report, which was released at the World Congress um, in July this year. The control community has been very good at developing reports, roadmaps to plan for the future. So there has been a history of our international community doing this, highlighting the grand challenges, the important problems um, that the community needs to focus upon. We can look back at the history of those. This report was um, coordinated by Francoise Laminabi Lagarigue in France, and many, many people from the community contributed to it, including myself. So there was a, a lot of international effort put into developing this report. And so particularly those of you who were at an early career where you're thinking, you're, I know we've got some master students in the audience, where, it, where you're thinking of maybe research in the future, certainly if you're in a researcher and you're thinking of a future in R&D uh, where you're going to have a long career, some of these things in this report, I, I will be retired, I'm sure, long before they're so sorted out. But for you, they will be the world that you will be working in. So I think it's particularly important to think about what we're doing in the light of, of this, uh, this report. It can also be helpful for getting funding for initiatives, uh, because clearly if you're trying to do something that is aligned with an international effort, then this gives very good um, support that you have a good idea. Okay. So, I'm, and then I'm going to look at two areas, um, two particular areas where we have been doing more involved work. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to look at, at a, an observer design, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about decentralized sliding mode control. So, how we we move towards very large scale types of problem and how we use some of the basic concepts we've talked about. So the mathematics, and I won't be going through all the mathematics, the mathematics might be heavy, but the actual concepts of what we're seeking to achieve and how we're doing it, how we're using canonical forms, how we're compensating for nonlinearity, how we're making sure we have suitable dynamics and how we satisfy reachability conditions are all just as we've been talking about at the start of this, um, uh, this particular course. And then I will pull together some 
conclusions. So the IFAC report was called Systems and Control for the Future of Humanity, Research Agenda, Current and Future Roles, Impact and Grand Challenges. And it literally had been worked on for three years. Um, within IFAC, we work in trienniums, three-year periods. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the president who took over in 2014 set this as one of the objectives that he wanted to be achieved in his presidency. And it looks very seriously both at where we are now. It looks at the previous reports, and I'm not going to talk about those um, because that's backward looking. You, you can look at those if you're interested. Um, for me, that the main interest is that this was very good at predicting um, what we should be doing and what would work well. Now, what this report is, is kind of doing is, is hypothesizing a step change in how we work as control engineers, and particularly how we interact with systems. So you'll more frequently now hear uh, the concept of control and systems engineers. Okay, so the systems element of our role is becoming more and more important. But we had a classical paradigm. Basically, people came, they gave us systems, that frequently didn't work as well as they would like them to have done. There could be many reasons for this. Um, in the automotive industry, my early problems where sliding mode controllers were applied, these were frequently systems where they wanted to use cheap components. So they could have used a much more expensive component and it didn't, wouldn't have had the problem. But, they wanted to keep down the cost of their vehicles. They're in a competitive market. They can't use the leading edge te technology on the average car. There is a, an end of high-end cars where people will pay huge sums for them, but the average man or woman in the street will not. They don't want their car prices to be skyrocketing because somebody's saying, oh, I've put a different actuator in the engine. So you have to use cheap elements you have to get good and robust performance out of them. The automotive industry was looking to take um, uh, a step change. So initially, people were saying, well, if you buy this car for 50,000 miles, many of these components were fine. They would then say, no, now for 100,000 miles, this, this, this engine will be fine. So it needed robustness and it needed these cheap components to perform well. And sliding mode control was a good answer, because it's cheap. You can take a cheap component, put in a cheap implementation, and answer some of these problems. And we were very, very good at that. And we saw control as a community make things be faster, more efficient, more reliable. We had great um, uh, uh, kind of uh, benefits in terms of improving energy um, in particular. And we had applications, aerospace, a key one for both your country and my country, where we have been seeking to, to, to push forward those industries, also automotive process and manufacturing industries. And when I came to control, that was very much the paradigm we were working on. And we have been hugely successful. What the report is hypothesizing for systems and control is the need for us to shift our paradigm. That we need system as and control in, to be applied to more very large scale, interdependent, multi-time scale, safety critical, and mission critical systems. So we need the kind of problems we're solving have become incredibly different. The, the paradigms around those problems have become different. When I was developing those early control laws using microprocessors, there was never any issues of cybersecurity. 
Now cyber security is a huge issue. If people can tackle some of our control systems in bad ways, then they can do much damage. We can put a controller there that's doing something very good. If it's hijacked, if it's given the wrong, uh, wrong information, this gives us a huge problem as a, as a community in terms of you know, keeping energy supplies going. Certainly at the start of my career, nobody mentioned cyber security at all. It just wasn't there. Now, it's right at the heart of the systems we're developing. And there is a big impact on control. Because in terms of control, it's an obvious thing in terms of information you're given, um, if you like, and, and indeed beginnings are, are, are being made in terms of looking at the kind of FDI we talked about, but applying them almost to, to monitor the computer networks to see if it's likely that signals are being changed, okay, um, which is a very, um, um, you know, is, is one of the easier ways to affect something, uh, 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 so, so, some bad change. So there are all kinds of things there, and systems are much bigger. We, we are absolutely key to those systems. You know, those systems have to be stable for a start-off. Who are the people in the international community that make things stable? Control engineers make things stable. But they don't just need to be stable, they need to be robust and exhibit good performance. And so we have a part to play there. Now, I think it's argued that we can't just come in at the end. You know, we can't just do like, like used to happen with, I've got this element, I want to use it, it doesn't quite do the right thing. Can you design a controller to make it behave better? Which was pretty well the paradigm. Can you make the system more energy efficient? Can you, whatever it happens to be. Now, with the scale of these systems, we have to move to the start. We have to be closer to the teams that are developing the systems in the first place. We know just from what we've learned in this lecture that there are certain channels of information that can be very helpful to us in terms of giving robustness in variance. If we can design systems so that we have the ability to provide that invariance, then surely that is a good thing to do. Sensors are clearly much more readily available than they were, and they're much cheaper in general, depending on the application, but there is a lot more cheap sensors available. Information is everywhere. And I think people thought initially, well, we're going to have all this information, um, and with all this information, it's going to be very obvious what to do. I think that um, paradigm has already been found to be flawed in many areas. Information has a place. But if you have loads of information, there becomes a big question about what you do with the information. What's important information? What's not important information? So the interaction of having information but also having structure about systems, it's the combination between the two that's going to give us uh, solutions, and they're likely to be multi-layered solutions. We're not going to be able to just have a control that, that does everything um, for our systems. So we're going to need to shift the paradigm. Now, um, this is... Um, I can't uh, read it on, on there myself. Let's see if I pass it back. I think this was just... Uh, let's see if I can make it black by... Um, forgive me a moment. I'll just try and... I didn't... Yeah. 
I just checked the first few slides and I that I could see it and um, hopefully we don't have many of those. Okay, great. So, apologies for that. Um, we have many, many things that are happening not in our space that are going to um, impact on us as control engineers. That point of information I talked about, the Internet of Things, is clearly one of the big things that is coming in. We're going to have lots of sensors, um, lots of network connectivity giving us lots of information. Obviously connected with Internet of Things is going to be control. What do you do with all that information? I don't know whether you call it Industry 4.0. Do you call it Industry 4.0 in India? Um, it tends to be called different things in different countries. I went to China and it's called something different. In Europe it's called Industry 4.0. But this is all about um, leveraging the sensing, control, uh, robustness, connectivity, connectivity, data analytics, particularly in the manufacturing industries. So it's all about uh, making sure that industry is achieving the best it possibly can um, from the environment we're now living in. Cyber physical systems, well, that's us. You know, if you think of cyber physical systems, we're right at the interface between the cyber and the physical. That's where control sits. So we're very, very important in terms of being in, in that space. And then even more than cyber physical systems, is coming into cyber physical, cyber physical and human systems. Um, so when we have humans in the loop. And this is all a huge challenge. One of my um, recent projects that I was working on at the University of Kent was about control for wheelchairs for neurological patients. And these spaces where we're making control systems for people who are being rehabilitated after surgery are very difficult. These individuals, what they can and can't do is likely to vary. They quickly can become tired. So at times they need more help than less help. On the face of it, Wheelchair control seems easy. You know, it's a motion control system. We put some sensors on it. We can move it around, get it through a door. But that isn't what they want. If I'm a young man who's had some sort of an accident um, and who is feeling reasonably well, I want to be under control. You know, I want that control system just to be helping me when I need it. I want to be able to be, as any other young man, determining... Uh, what I do and how I go. So these, what, what can be on the face of it at one level of the sort of the Newtonian dynamics, a very straightforward thing to do, is actually incredibly difficult because we need to have control systems that are responsive to the needs of the user. I've heard people talk about robotics. Okay, and I know a number of people in the audience are interested in robotics. Well, now we're going to have, and, and certainly in the UK at the moment, most robots that work um, with humans are effectively caged away. So to keep them safe, the humans are here, the robots are here, and there is something making sure the two of them are not um, interacting too closely together. The vision is that human and robots will come to act, um, 
react, uh, work together very much in the way we have been working together in this course. You know, how can we make sure that the humans are safe? Well, clearly, flexible robotics is one area, because if robots were much softer than they are, if we collide in the door, it doesn't really matter. You know, we can apologize and move on. Not massive damage done. If I collide with a KUKA robot swinging its arm round, then it's much harder um, and much more likely to do, to do that serious damage to me, not it. And so um, there are some ways of which we address those. But this whole issue of how would we find a robot that was polite? How could it operate with uh, people from different cultures in a way that they would find acceptable? All these questions are very difficult ones, and they all have impacts on control and how we design control. So what um, this report did is de defined five critical societal challenges, transportation, energy, water, healthcare, manufacturing. Um, and I think they're the obvious ones. I don't know, I haven't looked into the industrial strategy for India. We have one in the UK. We have a series of themes that our government wants us to, to work on. So robotics is there. Um, satellites and space technology is there. Manufacturing is there. Very much the same sort of thing. So if you look at most countries, you look at most... Um, uh, 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 challenges that are affecting society, these are an obvious five to pick. In fact, there was a Global Grand Challenges Summit earlier this year in Washington. It's the third one. The first one was in London in 2013. There was then one in China in 2015. And then it's been in the US in 2017. This defined a set of great uh, of grand challenges, where it defines sustainability, health, security, and joy of living, as well as education and public engagement. So very, very similar challenges. So if we're working in a space that aligns with those, the, those kinds of challenges, then we're aligned with societal needs internationally. Interestingly, as well as defining the um, five areas that appear upon the top. This is actually a graphic from the report. Down here has been identified a series of seven key research and innovation challenges. And these are needed for all of these. Okay, so we're now working in a two-dimensional space, really, and this is taking a look towards 2030 and what we need to have achieved by 2030. And if we see, we need to be able to accommodate distributed network control systems. So that will be certainly be one of the things I'm picking up um, a little bit later in this presentation. We need to be able to use data and we need to be able to impact, uh, interact with artificial intelligence. I don't know to which de what degree artificial intelligence is impacting yet in your departments and, and, and in the industry in, in India. But certainly within the UK, the government is pushing very hard for the uptake of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence does some very, very good things but it's usually in static environments. As soon as we've got dynamic environments interacting with arti artificial intelligence, we have the capability to generate new dynamics that we hadn't thought of, which for control engineers is really a challenge for us. So any systems that have intelligence in the loop that's going to interact with the, with the dynamics doesn't matter if it's path planning, if it's organizing, if it's at a static level, it's fine. But as soon as it starts interacting with the dynamics and the dynamics start changing because of the use of artificial intelligence, then dynamic changes, we're not just looking at parameter variations, 
we're looking at potentially huge changes in dynamics, which control is going to have to deal with. Other things um, in this list relate to things I've talked about before. The impact of humans, for example, in our, loop, in our loop. So it's a very exciting time for control. And it's a, our sliding mode control, the topic of this program, is in a very good place to make an impact because it's robust. If you look at that report, robustness is at the heart. If you've got dynamics that might change, then robustness is key. If you've got layered control, if fundamentally you're going to need to switch between different things happening at different layers. So everything we do is at the heart of that problem. So some of the things we need to solve is how can we design controls for large network systems over wireless communication channels where the data we get, we might not get a particular input. That's a, I won't talk so much about that problem today, but that's a problem I've been looking at um, from the theoretical point of view, that if you've got a big network system and suddenly you don't know information about what's happening elsewhere, which could happen, how do you make sure your part stays stable? Okay, which is a robustness problem. It's a robustness problem which has impacts of interaction dynamics and so <coughs> and interconnections. And so we want a control law and we developed a very nice variable structure control law that on the back of very limited information could keep the system stable. Might not be the best performing control law in the world because clearly if you don't have much information about what's going on, you can't, you can't push the performance. But do you need to maintain stability? Of course you do. And is it hard with limited information? Yes, it is. So looking at that problem is, is a very, very important one. I've already said about the cybersecurity dimensions. That is going to be prevalent across society, I think, um, now, uh, well into the future. Um, and using those sliding mode observers, how we can use the FDI approaches that we have seen to be so successful in terms of many um, industrial applications, can they be used in the communication networks? Can they monitor communication networks to check that things are happening well there. It's a fault detection. You know, cyber security at one level is a fault detection and isolation problem. Um, and work is beginning to be done in that space. And I think that's quite an exciting um, space. I've said um, about this, this issue where we've got learning. So we're all being pushed. And, you know, I don't know whether you, you see that. Certainly some of the people who work in robotics in the UK who are not control engineers, they'll pick up intelligent algorithms from groups and implement them in their systems. They have no idea what may or may not happen under extreme conditions. You know, nothing has been proved about those algorithms. Um, so this issue of intelligence in the loop and how we deal with that intelligence and the impact on the dynamics is, is very good. Because effect is a very big issue for us. Because fundamentally, systems which have intelligence and adapt, we know adaptation can be good, but we need to make sure that the adaptation isn't bad. Because otherwise, we can adapt into something which is highly undesirable. And control has a part to play there. Um, I think that um, this, these big uh, systems, such as energy networks, where we're going to be dealing at everything from the individual uh, 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 you know, piece of um, kit that's at the um, generation end, right the way through to the consumers um, who are using them, um, as well as to 
the industry and the markets that are regulating the e economic side of this. This is a huge system, and there will become more and more systems of this type. In, in, in a sense, energy is ahead of the game because it's such a an important um, and precious resource. But there are going to become more of those socio-technical -techn systems that, uh, that cross potentially boundaries of countries. So, for example, the power in the UK, some of the energy comes from France. It comes under the sea from, from France. So we're not even talking about people in one country. Um, it becomes much more like the banking system. And boy, do we know what happened when that went wrong. We had a huge problem. So these problems are incredibly difficult. So what do we have? What are the phenomena that we have in terms of complexity? Well, certainly nonlinearity, even without any intelligence in the system. If we have significant nonlinearity, we can have very, very rich dynamic behavior. Systems will always be uncertain. Um, uh, you know, and I think the example I gave of the, the vehicle and the need to use cheap components, technology can be leading. It might be that there is a technological solution to some problems um, that's very advanced, but not everywhere in the world will be able to use that solution for various reasons, and some areas which could use it may choose not to use it. So they may choose for reasons of cost. So there will always be people um, using um, technology which in itself adds additional uncertainty into the, uh, into the system. Time delay is a big issue. Now, as soon as we're talking about network systems, we're dealing with things that aren't just changing over time, they're, dis they're distributed over space as well. So for most of our early control systems, we had an element that was there with us. Now we're going to have systems which are distributed over time and space, and we're going to have to deal consequently with issues of delay. I do want to say something to, to you about delay, though, because I think people assume delay is bad. How many people would assume delay is bad? Yeah, people usually do, and maybe uh, until I got involved in a piece of work um, with some French collaborators, uh, my view of delay changed. I think we think it's bad because frequently as control engineers there's delay in the system and often we see it as a means which makes the control problem harder to solve. But that isn't always the case. Delay, appropriately chosen delay, can be a good thing. In fact, you might be interested to know, and we, dis we discovered it in terms of a particular desired sliding mode dynamics that we set up for a particular system. We had a system which wasn't stabilizable by output, output feedback. So you could say it, it just wasn't stabilizable if you measured the output. However, it was stabilizable if you used the output and a delayed output. So delay can be good if it's appropriate. Okay? So we should never get into the mindset of thinking delay is bad. Delay impacts on dynamics, um, and, and it makes dynamics more complex. But well-chosen delay can help. And in that particular case, my sliding mode um, performance, I could design a sliding mode performance that very nicely and robustly stabilized this system depending on delayed output signals. Which, of course, we have. It just means that the output has memory. Should memory be bad? We have memory. We use it very well in terms of what it lets us do. So memory necessarily, you know, if you think of delay as memory, suddenly you think, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing. 
So we mustn't be kind of black and white about complex. Yes, it's complexity. It's more complex to deal with. But it's not. Complexity doesn't necessarily equal bad. Complexity means we have to understand things in a different and deep way. But it might mean that it's actually better. And some of the biological examples we will see, where we see um, in our session this afternoon, we will see things which, um, you know, where you might have thought, well, wh why wouldn't there be a simpler controller? Um, uh, uh, why have some nonlinearity there, which is more complex? We've just said nonlinearity gives rich phenomena. Well, actually, it does a very good job, S simple nonlinearity. So, um, complexity, yes, bad. Not necessarily. It depends on the system. And then something I'm very interested in, which is interaction, interconnection between subsystems, which is absolutely key to the future. You know, most systems will be interacting with other systems. They will not just be autonomous by themselves. They will need to be interacting with other systems, that might be the same systems as they are. They might be different systems, very different systems. They might be technical systems interacting with human systems. They might be spread over time. They might be spread over space. Um, uh, 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 so highly uh, relevant for the future. How do we deal with interconnections? How do we make sure we have at least stability in failure conditions if we have lots of interconnections. A hard problem, but surely one that we've got that we should be able to solve. And one where we know sliding modes, I've already hinted to you, we know that in terms of nonlinearity and uncertainty, we're robust. I've, I've just given you an example of where we use time delay in the sliding mode um, dynamics in order to be able to stabilize a system based on the output, which you couldn't do via other methods. And then this interactions and interconnections that we'll see in the discussion we have uh, uh, later on on our decentralized work, which we have a lot of work in that area. I can just show you a little bit of the work in that area. Sliding mode's absolutely key in, in all these areas. So we've got at the heart of our philosophy, and we will use this in everything we do, design in a sliding surface which gives us performance. We did that with the controller. We did that with the observer. It was just the um, difference between um, the um, measured output and the actual output. Something which we have which defines our performance, and then some sort of control or injection signal that makes sure we get to this in finite time. And whether it's an interconnected network system or whether it's a DC motor, those are the two things that we're interested in. And we know that robustness is important and it's a structural property. So we need to be aware of the domain we're doing those things. So here's a nice little nonlinear example, small scale, um, where we try and make stabilize the system. So it's a bit up from the inverted pendulum. We can design a, a linear controller here that takes out the nonlinear dynamics. So all the nonlinearities in the range space takes out the nonlinear dynamics, puts a pole uh, here <coughs> to stabilize the system. Here we look at putting in a sliding mode controller. So again, we take out the harder dynamics. We don't need to do it because it's in the range space of U. So we could have, we could not have that there. We would need a bigger switch here, but we'll take it out because we know what it is. And again, that's a message. I hope that's being clear in every day. Everything we've done, if there's something we've known about that we can easily get rid of, whether we're designing a controller problem or an observer problem, 
it's better to do it. We needn't do it because we can just put a bigger switch, but it's better to do it and then use the, this here to deal with the really hard things rather than overcoming things we could have directly cancelled out. If you look what happens here, you can see that it does indeed stabilise the system, but it goes a little bit around the houses here in order to, uh, to, 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 to get there. So it takes a little bit of time, but it um, eventually comes into the origin. If I click and do the sliding mode controller, it's much, much faster. It's much closer to the origin, much more quickly. Okay, so we're able to do this much more quickly. So this is asymptotic motion still, asymptotic motion, but <laughs> you can still see it moving a little bit there round and round the origin. So much faster, much more, uh, it, much more efficient. I've done a range of simulations there which show for all these different initial conditions, even for a nonlinear system. Remember, often we say, and I got asked a question this morning, it's always a good question, what about the initial conditions? Well, remember with sliding modes, initial conditions just affect the reaching phase. They do not affect the sliding phase. So, so long as we can get there quickly, Initial conditions are far less of a problem for us than other nonlinear control methods. We know that nonlinear systems will exhibit very different behaviors in, in response um, to different in initial conditions. A linear system, uh, it, it's much more straightforward. But once we've got nonlinearity here with the sliding mode, yes, and we've taken points, you know, across almost every quadrant here of this nonlinear system, the initial phase is different in each case. But the final phase is identical and is not dependent at all upon the initial conditions. So when we're dealing with that first area of nonlinearity in terms of our complexity, it takes away the problems relating to initial conditions. So, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about one of our um, more recently designed observers, um, um, and which doesn't just do observer design, it actually has does some parameter estimation as well. Now, we know very well what an observer is. This is my slide from yesterday. Um, we are interested in a sliding mode observer which makes this, e this output error here identically equal to zero. And I'm doing this um, in this particular problem. This is a problem which we could use for system control, which so we, we want to find estimates of the states, um, or we want to find parameters, or we want to do fault detection and isolation. And yesterday we were asked the question about, you know, would we use the same one for control and, and FDI? Um, and I said you could, but we don't usually. And I would certainly say that you will get a better observer, you will get better performance out of your system if you design an observer for the particular purpose you have in mind. So if you're designing a, an observer for FDI, then the channels need very much to be geared up to the likely faults. If you're de designing an observer that, where you want to e estimate the states, that the behavior of those re residual dynamics is much more important to Taylor. So it's going to depend on what you're doing the overhead in implementation, as we've talked about, is not huge. So you can design an observer, a sliding mode observer, and implement it very, very uh, uh, quickly. Um, it's not that you need masses of code that's really going to slow down systems in real-time implementations. So 
design your observer for which, for which area you, you want, because then you'll get a better observer. You know, don't be a black box and say, oh, this is an observer, it's going to do everything. Think, what's my problem? What, what is at the heart of this complex system? Um, and, and then design it appropriately for what you're seeking um, to do. So, why did we use a sliding mode observer for, for, for this? Well, um, we, we wanted to build on the work we, we, we did. Uh, you may have seen, I, don't, I can't remember whether we included, I think we might have included it in the pack, but I wrote a, a, a survey paper um, on sliding mode observers in 2008. Um, that's another one. It is on ResearchGate. If it wasn't in the pack of information I, I, I sent for you. But in that system, we didn't sit, consider anything at all about delay. So we didn't consider delay in the dynamics or delay in the measurement. And clearly, um, when there is delay in the dynamics or delay in the measurement, things become much harder. I mentioned to you yesterday what we do when there's delay in the measurement and that I have a means um, of, of, of solving that problem, which I haven't presented here, um, but I'm happy to give you information. I'm not, and I'm not going to present it here, but I am going to start to think about delay. If you're interested in delay systems, this is a really seminal um, paper. He did a survey of time delay systems. It's fairly theoretical, so it's, it's, it's for the brave who feel really interested, um, but it's a very, very good survey. It's nothing to do with sliding modes particularly, but just all to do about the whole area of time, um, time delay uh, systems. We want to get more robustness, um, and we want to um, reduce the conser conservative, any conservativeness. So, and by that I mean that it's going back to that question of saying, compensate for the bits I know. Many results in the literature seek to um, drive the error to zero, but don't necessarily use that information about the known signals directly. And if you don't do that, you will get conservative designs. It might not matter if you've just got a little power converter. Some of the, you know, some of the people in the class are interested in designing sliding mode observers for, for um, and controllers for, for power converters. But if you've got a highly complex system and you don't use that information you know, then your design will be incredibly conservative, unduly conservative. So as the complexity increases, the need to include that information about the, the things you know is, is more important. It becomes more and more important. So as complexity increases, as order increases, the need to reduce conservativeness, conservativeness in the design becomes more and more important. So that reducing this conservatism is, is, is quite an important thing to do as we move into the domain of complex systems. It's good practice anyway. So, you know, that's why in the very simple designs we did, I encouraged you um, to... To, to do that for the simple controllers, um, but, um, um, but for complex systems, it becomes highly, uh, highly important. So, what we've got is an error system um, where we seek to make that subsystem um, in insensitive to matched uncertainty. So the sliding part of the system will be insensitive to matched uncertainty. Now we haven't said much about what matched uncertainty is. Matched uncertainty 
is that uncertainty that um, enters into the system in channels that are implicit in the input channels. So in terms of the problems um, we've considered, when we applied the disturbance to the pendulum system, we applied it in the channel where you acted. So it was matched uncertainty. So it's completely insensitive to matched uncertainty. We can reduce the order. But we need to bear in mind that systems don't just have matched uncertainty. They might have ma unmatched uncertainty as well. So if we think of a system description here that we, we might have for a, a more complex system, we've got a linear part here, A times X, which we can think of as a nominal linear dynamic. We've still got an output equation CX, something that we've measured. But we're letting ourselves have nonlinearity in the system. And this has no delta in front of it. That triangle there is a delta. And if we have a triangle in front, that means I don't know it. That means it's uncertain. Okay? So I have nonlinearity in the system where F here can depend on not just the state, but also delayed state information. So there is time delay in my system. And there are also parameters in my system, theta, which I may not know. So I've got a system where I know A, I know some nonlinear things about it. These nonlinear things may have parameters I don't know, and they may be subject to delay. I'll also have some uncertainty in my system, which just as we've done with everything else, we're assuming is bounded. So we have something uncertain which is bounded. So we've broadened out our paradigm to not just being a linear system, but to being a non-linear system where we have no known bounds. Now, in the work we have been doing most lately, we have been looking at nonlinear bounds. So the bounds are not just a number, um, which is constant, um, uh, which has been very much the, um, the case um, uh, for, for much of the literature. So much of the literature has been assuming that bounds have been quite simple. So bounds were either linear or polynomial. We're trying to look at bounds being um, nonlinear. And if you think this, come from, if this comes from a nonlinear model, We've got some uncertainty delta F, and we bound it. It's much more likely that we can come up with a nonlinear bound than if we find something which is purely linear, which might be incredibly conservative for a start, so which might give me huge problems um, in terms of uh, my system. So we've got uh, n these nonlinear bounds um, our uncertainty is still bounded. This here would be linear bounds, which is uh, where the, much of the literature started. It moved on to people having polynomial bounds, so that use the norm of the X. But in our case, we can have a nonlinear bound. So um, we can bound by a nonlinear function, which might be the real nonlinear function. We are going to have um, move away from having a structure which is known. Much of a lot of the literature will assume a structure, and often it assumes B there, so it will assume matched uncertainty, um, and that's the simplest possible case we can have. Alternatively we can um, have matched and unmatched uncertainty and deploy the structure in a, in a clever way. Um, we are, are not here imposing anything 
on the particular structure of the uncertainty. Um, the parameters, we're letting them be appear again. They're not just linear. So it's not just sort of like a theta x type or theta x1 type term. Our parameters can appear um, in a, in a, in a non-linear um, sense. Um, so this describes um, how previous people have just had some constant times theta as how the parameters appear in their system. Some people have had the parameters multiplied by a function. We let our parameters be part of a nonlinear function. And we have time delay. Time delay is, is, is everywhere. As soon as we move the paradigm to complex systems that become um, distributed over time and space, we have time delay. We can't get away from having um, time uh, delay. There's lots and lots of work on different types of delay, and we have worked on many of them. So um, Jing Ang Yan is one of uh, my uh, co collaborators. We did a lot of work on, on, on state delay. Um, uh, we've done work as well on input and output delay, because the output delay work relates to the observer I talked to you about, saying how we deal with the sampling. Here, we're going to look at state delay. We're going to make some assumptions, and don't worry that, that the mathematics is, is not important. I, I'm going to explain what the mathematics need, means in, in words. So for some of you who may be more, the mathematics will not be so daunting, but if it is, then don't worry. I'm going to make an observability assumption here on, on AC. I've clearly got a lot going on in this system. Um, and I assume um, that I, um, <coughs> the nonlinearity I know about is Lipschitz, so just the same as we had for the differentiator, which means that we know there is a, 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 a bound and the impacts on the solution of the, of the system. Um, and then we have an assumption which looks a bit funny, but what that effectively means is that we're in our stability result, we need to be able to determine a particular um, structure to ensure um, stability. And so that assumption says I need to have that particular structure. It's a lot of work there, but I'm just wanting to point out some elements that are going to be familiar. We've got two types of dynamics here. We can see, just as we had before, that new here depends on the output error. It's a switch, just like we had before. So this is a switch, OK? So it's no more difficult than the observer we, uh, that we designed in terms of what the action is doing. You see gain matrices here, L, just like we had yesterday, that are stabilizing sub-elements of the system. So we just, and in fact, the transformation is very similar. We're getting rid of some elements of the, um, of the non-linearity we know about by defining our observer to have those elements in as a function of Z1 hat, okay? So our observer looks quite like a copy of the plant, but we've deployed um, linear gains, so Leuenberger type gains, just as we did yesterday, we've got a switch and we've incorporated much of what we've got here in terms of the nonlinearity. And we're also designing an adaptive law here to estimate the theta. If you do that, you can form the error dynamics. Several people have talked about using systems with adaptation one thing that you must always be aware of is you've got to exp 
expands your aerodynamics. So here, E1 and E2, those elements correspond to um, the observer. Okay, so they're the observer aerodynamics. This is the error in the, the estimate of theta. Okay, and you need all of it to be stable. So you can't, and you shouldn't consider them separately either. So you need to consider the whole system. Okay, so writing down those error dynamics, you're going to get bits here. These, if you like, are errors depending on the difference between my known function f when evaluated at the actual state um, and when evaluated at the estimated state. So there's going to be some little errors in there um, um, from the, the estimation because we haven't said everything's matched. If everything's matched, it would all be down here and we wouldn't have a problem. But we have let the uncertainty spread through the whole system, which means there will be some unmatched uncertainty up there that will depend on the difference in the known functions f evaluated at the state values compared to the known functions f evaluated at the observer. What we have as a result is that our system, despite all that nonlinearity, despite the delay, it is bounded if we can solve um, out for this uh, matrix here. I'm not going to say uh, a, a lot about this. I just want to present the kind of system we can do with it, the results we get, and then focus on an example. Um, here, the observation error um, is made to exhibit a sliding mode. This is making sure the observer gain is big enough. Okay? These are the Lipschitz constants corresponding to those, uh, to those uncertainty bounds. And so we applied this to a bioreactor. So we know what a bioreactor is. It's a vessel. We've got some sort of chemical process uh, being carried, uh, out, carried out. So these are examples of um, bioreactors. We have um, it's a nonlinear system. We have biomass concentration, sulfate concentration, sulfide concentration as the state. We don't know um, the influence sulfate concentration. We have a very nonlinear model. So it is the kind of nonlinear model, a um, bit like our pendulum, where we see the nonlinearity. To actually linearize this, um, as we did for the pendulum, probably isn't going to give you such good results. We can for the inverted pendulum on a cart, but here we can see we have quite a lot of non-linearity appearing in there, and so we are going to use it within our observer design as the F, and then we're going to recognize that it might be uncertain as well. And so if you see the kind of results we get, you can see it's very slow, and these biological processes are incredibly uh, slow. You can see for the three states, we get very good estimation very quickly. For the second two, if we look here, these, these are the outputs. So they're the things we're going to slide on, the second two. This is coming from the free dynamics in the sliding mode, which is subject to unmatched uncertainty. So the biomass is taking a while to settle down, but it's going the right way. The parameter estimation and the control, we can see control very smooth, not overly aggressive at all, which you can't have for these kind of systems, which involve growing of bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the parameter com is coming in to the uh, value. You can see that probably the biggest limitation in this design is the parameter estimate. That's probably the thing that's impacting here on the, um, on the biomass. So has anybody got any questions um, about that? 
we saw it took the canonical form such that we we know it split it into two we saw the bits we learned about yesterday um, we saw there was delay and we saw we could use nonlinearity and we saw pretty good results in fact we've extended those results to be a family of observers we have used it for uh, a series of reactors okay when they're interconnected with each other um, and so we do have this result for a um, interconnected system but I decided to present the observer one just for the single one and then present the controller for a interconnected um, system. So I'm, I'm you happy for me to continue? Yep. Okay. So, what do we mean, mean about interconnected systems? Well, fundamentally, they're systems where the behavior of one thing impacts on other things. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything impacts on, its set, on, on everything else, but it means there is exchange, connection between different elements of the system in different ways. And a, a simple example is a coupled pendulum or a multi-link robot system. You can think of that as an interconnected system. Some systems are much more uh, 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 involved. So, for example, um, power networks, um, where we're uh, considering um, energy generation over large areas um, involving many different substations, many different, uh, um, many different uh, consumers. So there are all sorts of interconnected systems. How do we model them? Well, the first thing we note is that if we've got N interconnected systems, we're effectively going to have N submodels. Okay? So each of these is a vector still, a vector X. So we have a vector X1, which is the state of the first subsystem, a vector X2, which is the state of the second subsystem, etc. And every subsystem has its own dynamics. So subsystem one has dynamics x1 dot equals a1 x1 plus b1 u1. But it also has some interconnection terms here, where gi here will depend not only on um, itself, but uh, everything else. Okay, so here GI, I, I didn't say that very well. GI here depends on the, the, the I subsystem. But every I subsystem will have some dynamics here which depend on all the other subsystems. And so there may well be terms we know. So just using the, the notation we had before, this is something which is known, so there isn't a delta there. Um, this is something which is unknown. We can see that again, we're allowing delays. Because signals, if you've got these interconnected systems, very likely the signal that a, a, a system sees at another point at the same instant in time will be delayed because there has to be transfer between the subsystems. So delays are going to be key. So this is the nominal system. This is known interconnections. This is uncertainty around the interconnection. And in our formulations, we are dealing with a decentralized system, which means system I only knows about its own output. It doesn't know about all the outputs. It's affected by them in terms of the dynamics, but it just knows about its own output. Okay? And that summarizes what we have. Whoops. So here we've just considered three subsystems. 
And this is explaining what we mean by decentralized static output feedback control. We've got a local controller in each subsystem, which, as I said, just knows about its own output. So it, it only knows about its own output, but it's affected by the adjacent subsystem. So this subsystem here is affected by this one, affected by this one, via the interconnection terms, but the control is purely local. So that's why we call it a decentralized control. And that's very interesting for large-scale systems because how do you stay stable with a local control when you're subject to interactions which could be uncertain? So this says it's just a local control. Each eye only knows about its own system. There have been quite a lot of uh, uh, work on time delay interconnections. Some of it is more practical than others. I mean, here there's no delay in the interconnections. I would have thought the interconnections would be the key, one of the key places where the delay would, would uh, impact physically. Um, there has been uh, uh, additional work um, that looks at things like adaptive control, backstepping, and our kind of work um, uh, to, to, to give good robustness in the presence of time delay. As soon as we're using, as soon as we have systems and are kind of skirted over that in terms of the, um, the observer problem, we need to use more uh, 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 different approaches to prove the stability. Um, again, for many of you, that won't be something you want to get involved in, but I think it's important that you know that you can't just apply traditional Lyapunov methods. You can apply either of these two, um, the, the Krakowski approach or the Razuminkin uh, 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 approach. What we do is... Um, decompose the interconnections. So we decompose them into matched and unmatched parts. We know that the matched parts which appear in the B channel, not a problem for us. The sliding mode control can get rid of them. But we need to be able to look at the uncertain parts here, um, which are... Uh, um, also um, in terms of the matched part. So we've got known interconnections, uncertain interconnections. We split off the matched part of both of them. Okay? We can deal with that very nicely. If we know what it is, what, why not split it off? You notice that the assumptions we had yesterday come into play. Rank CB for each of the subsystems must be N. I must be able to get a unique equivalent control to be able to do this cancellation of this matched, um, matched uncertainty. Um, I also have to have the structural condition, okay, um, as output feedback sta stabilizable, okay? Um, so I need to make sure that any... It's more complicated because everything isn't just... Uh, linear, <coughs> but I need to be able to stabilize uh, my system. All of my uncertainty needs to be bounded. Okay. Um, so what we can do, having put that together, we can design a sliding surface. And it's just the output. Okay. In fact, rather like with than that, we have a scaling of the output. Okay? So rather like we saw for the observer, we take a scaling of the output error. So very simple for this control problem. That then gives me a sliding mode dynamics which is uh, impacted by the unmatched uncertainty 
of both the known part of the interconnections and the uncertain part of the interconnections. This, I have one of these sets of the sliding mode dynamics for each of the subsystems. So every subsystem, so I have N of these. Okay? The order of each of these is Ni minus Mi, just the same as uh, reduced order when we just had one of them. So, we can show that we can get a, a sliding motion which is globally uniformly stable if we have some testable conditions satisfied. So, we can find some conditions. For reachability, we need to be able to solve that constrained Lyapunov problem we met there. We need to be able to find the corresponding F. We need that if we want a global result. So if we want the system to be stable from any initial condition anywhere, we need that constrained Lyapunov problem to be satisfied. If we're happy with the local result, we can lift that. Um, but global results are, are better. What does the reachability condition look like for interconnected systems? Well, it's actually a sum of reachability conditions for each of the subsystems, which might be what you'd expect. If you satisfy it for each of them, then clearly you're going to be able to satisfy it for uh, the sum. The control has bits we know, so that known interaction, that, that, that known nonlinearity, and that any known interactions will be cancelled out by this um, controller. And we're using discontinuity, which is modulated by the size of these various interconnection terms. So we can actually get this system to slide globally. It's nice to finish with an example. It's not massively um, in, in, in size, um, largely because um, you saw that it's, it's quite heavy to be doing these things, and so to, to present in a slide a massive system um, is difficult to do. But this is clearly an interconnected system. It's a pollution control problem. So it's, it's two rivers interacting um, to, together. Clearly, they are, uh, you're not going to be able to um, control them um, in a kind of, uh, as we said, you, know, you need to have an independent control for, for each uh, uh, river, which might be putting some you know, different bacteria or whatever it happened to be in, 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 into that system. Um, or, or different nutrients. I mean, for example, if you've got a river where the population of algae and bacteria is out of kilter, putting in certain nutrients like vitamin B12 or carbon or something like this can be a control to, to, uh, to, 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 to affect this. So we've got this um, model of um, river um, pollution uh, control significant nonlinearity, and clearly it's interconnected. Um, we can see here for the first system, X1, it is impacted um, by, uh, I think that there is a typo, that should be X1, not X2. Um, but we can see coming through here the outputs of um, the first subsystem, for example, affecting the second subsystem, the state of the first system, affecting the second subsystem. So we have two outputs, um, and we want to uh, make sure that this system uh, attains um, a, a better steady state. So we try and get our sliding surface to be Y1, and y2 equals zero. The control we come out, which is just from applying our results, nonlinear, 
It's using some of the nonlinearity from the system. If you um, look in here, it's using some of that um, nonlinearity. And we can see that we get very, very nice results. Here's x1, the first element of the first of the state of the first subsystem. So the first state of the first subsystem um, is here. The second state of the first subsystem is the green one here. The first state of the second subsystem is here. The second state of the second subsystem is here. If we look at what the outputs were, going right back were the first states, okay? So if we look at the responses, we can see the sliding mode on the first state of the first subsystem, the first state of the second subsystem, very nicely reached, very nicely reached. And this is based on output information only, so only output information. And then the three, dy the three dynamics of the other two states coming into zero much more slowly, um, but a, clearly attains a sliding mode. So for the systems we considered, we showed that we can solve observer problems, we can solve control problems, they can have delays in them, um, they can have nonlinearity in them, they can be interconnected as we require for complex systems. We can deal with wide types of uncertainty. It doesn't have to be parametric. It can be structural. Um, we can have nonlinear variation of the parameters. Um, we can have nonlinear bounds um, on our system. We can have delay in the systems, which is, is definitely going to be there, recognizing that it might not necessarily be bad. So sometimes delays a system including those delay signals, might be easier to control than a system without those si signals. We, we have these huge structural benefits to enable us to deal with the matched and unmatched parts. And we can get global results that work for any set of initial conditions. So when it comes to actually um, applying these very basic ideas of determine a sliding surface, look at the channels where the uncertainty acts, develop an appropriate canonical form which relates to the channels, which relates to um, where either our input or our output signals are um, in our system. Set a suitable dynamic performance which might not have to be, you know, it might vary with uncertainty a little bit, as we saw. If it's unmatched uncertainty, it will. But we can still design a suitable one, and we can always design a controller which forces S to zero, okay? That, in some sense, that reachability solution is the easy part. We've just got to remember that when we're doing this for an interconnected system, we've got to make sure that we do it for every subsystem. Because in that way, the whole thing will go to zero if it's satisfied across uh, each of them. So I think that was all I wanted to say. It's the end of the heavy mathematics. I tried to bring the mathematics down to a minimum because I wanted, but I did want you to see the kind of things we can do, you know, without laboring the point to... Uh, 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 too much. So lots of details were missed. Um, at that very nonlinear end, um, Jing and Chris and I have actually published a new book that um, became available in January, that so came out in January, that looks across a lot of the work we did in um, decentralized and centralized control of um, dynamic systems using uh, 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 sliding modes. So, um, for complex systems, so it, it pulls together all those all those results. So some of you may be interested in looking at that if it's in your library in your university. 
Okay, so shall I see if there's any questions? You can you can surely do that. I mean, it depend for me it depends on the model reduction approach. Um, some of the model reduction approaches lose the physics. You know, I think model reduction approaches that actually just take out certain dynamics that are less important, I don't have a problem with, because then you can understand what you're losing and why. Some model reduction approaches can be. Um, black box, you know, so you don't really know what your system is anymore. And to get the best out of sliding mode control and sliding mode observation, you need to physically understand the system. So um, I think it depends on the approach, but I would caution with black box approaches, because in general, I think black box approaches have limitations, um, because as soon as we lose structure, we lose valuable information. And as systems become large scale and complex, losing that information on the structure can actually lose a lot, um, particularly if the model originally was uncertain. Sorry? Yes. Yes. But it still had the same number of states. Well, as I'm saying to you, I mean, it can be. I'm just saying I would caution how you're doing the model reduction. You know, I think model reduction, which happens for good physical reasons, where you understand that losing these, particularly for nonlinear and complex systems, you've got to fully understand the impact of losing those dynamics so that you can accommodate it in your design. Some of these black box systems that, you know, say just take something out and give you this and all the states have changed that it's not the same system at all. Um, I would caution that that was a good idea. I think you will probably lose more than you gain for complex systems because you're losing such a lot of information um, by, by doing that. So model reduction isn't necessarily bad. I've done it myself in a number of designs but don't use black box approaches. Use approaches which are um, let you keep a handle on the dynamics you've lost and why. Otherwise, when you design controllers which are going to have to be applied to the real system, you might find something comes into play which you just haven't designed against because it's, nothing is there. It's also more difficult, I think, to get good performance when the states don't have physical meaning. Well, that's reducing the order, so it's like unmodeled dynamics. So unmodeled dynamics are a different are a different matter. Um, so it isn't the case that. Yep. Yes. 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 No, yes, I'd agree with that. But I think if you've got an, an interconnected complex system with lots of states and you're using those, you know, that, that approach of second to, is using no knowledge of the system, is it? So, you know, it's it, that, that that's a, a black box approach, but it's just at the level of one System, one, one subsystem. If you're doing it over multiple interacting systems, then it's, it's, I think you'll, you will, you know, how to do the design for the problem. That's why I think it's a balance of, of, of having data that gives you models, but also in structure, knowing how the system hangs together is the key to getting the best, the best performance. Um, it doesn't mean it won't work. It just means I think it's a, a more risky approach. Mm -hmm. 
No. No. Well, it will if we do it in the present, if we consider the interconnections as dynamic things. But, you know, no. I mean, that, that's what happened with the banking system um, when that um, destabilized rather spectacularly. Ba banking regulation said that if bank keeps enough, um, effectively what reserves, so enough money, um, then they would be robust to things happening around them. But they weren't, even though they had money, because they couldn't interact. They were also impacted by the interconnections. So you've got to take care of the interconnections. So you can stabilize um, just locally, but you have to have information about... I mean, there I'm stabilizing locally. The controller is a local controller, but the overall system is stable because I'm dealing with the interconnections in the design problem. So you would need to have models that didn't just model your subsystem, but modeled the impact of the interactions on that subsystem too. No, I mean, it's like delay. There can be good and bad interconnections. Um, no, so interconnections aren't necessarily um, disruptive at all. Um, you know, they're something that needs to be considered, and they can be good and they can be bad, the same as we saw with delay. Delay can have a stabilizing effect, you know, so having information from a signal and a delayed part of that signal, you can in fact have richer dynamics and be able to do more with that impact of memory than you can with, without. So it's just the same with, with interconnections. It's the dynamics to be dealt with, so, and we have to check. Um, and it's only by checking we can assure it's stable. But um, the dynamics that is there um, needs to be checked because it, it could be bad. It might be good, it could be bad. Um, so you just have to deal with it appropriately. Well, that isn't cascaded at all. It's local controllers. So the controllers are all independent in that problem. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't involve... I mean, supervisory control is, is frequently about what the references and the set, the set points should do. If your system is stable, then it, it should be fine with uh, getting another, another set point. Um, and again, so long as you've modeled the interconnections correctly, you know about the impact of those states which are being moved by the supervisory control to another point. You know you've dealt with them. So um, that's why the layering um, is, is important. But, but at the, but the bottom layer, in some sense, uh, you know, the overarching layer that stabilizes the system, this is, this is very key. Choosing a different set point, particularly if it's a global result, doesn't impact on stability at all. So, you know, doing that in cleverer ways might make you more energy efficient, it might make... But, you know, dynamically, it's not going to affect the dynamics of the um, interconnected system.